I've just had the pleasure of speaking with Josh from Net Control and Nick from Ruckus Networks, who are both care sector connectivity experts. Most care leaders understand the need for a great internet connection, but with the ever increasing amount of technology being used in care, often the right technology and infrastructure isn't in place. This can be a big problem because it can put residents and service users at risk. If you want to find out how, well, you're going to have to watch this whole episode. So I'm Simon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Care Leaders Network, which is the professional community for the leaders of care organisations. And this means that I have the pleasure of hosting the Care Leaders Network podcast, where I get to speak with guests about subjects that will help care leaders to build remarkable care organisations. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So gentlemen, digital connectivity, are your care services enabled correctly? It's an important question. I, I was thinking about this before and I was kind of thinking to myself, there are moments when you have um, your, uh, your Wi-Fi goes down or your screen starts buffering or your internet connection fails altogether. And that's at home just whilst you're watching Netflix. In care services, I can imagine that the implications are probably uh, a bit more significant than me watching my latest series. So I'm really interested to get into the subject matter for today. So let's start with a, an obvious question. So why is it so important to get connectivity right in care services? If you think about what's happened over the last two, three, four years, the whole landscape has changed in terms of people's expectation, what they want to be able to see, do, get access to, but more importantly, especially in the care environment, is how can you help and treat and provide services to their customers in that type of environment? Um, it was interesting. I was on a webinar yesterday um, with a number of app providers for the care services market, and every single one of them was talking about a dementia app or a heart rate app or whatever. But none of them had really talked about the fact is that most of them, it doesn't work because they don't have one a mobile phone signal or two Wi-Fi for it to connect to. So it's actually quite redundant. Um, so I posed the, posed the question to them and they went, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. And I think now with um, the care industry wanting to be able to provide um, telemedicine, remote telehealth care, uh, and more importantly about isolation and people wanting to talk to their family, getting the infrastructure and connectivity right first time is very important. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I could agree with you, Nick, more. I mean, uh, you know, if you look over the last five years, the amount of technology out there, but particularly what's coming into that care organisation with, as Nick said, the cloud applications, peripheral devices, um, you know, we're seeing as well, I think, more accessibility to solutions as well, which is increasing. But what we're also seeing is whilst there's this rise of adoption of technology, it's the connectivity behind it that isn't being thought about properly. So you're seeing these care services, cloud services being bought in, like the app developers, they're thinking for the end goal without those steps that come before it. So I think this is actually why why is it why it's important to get connectivity right? Because it it not only covers you right now with what services, solutions you may have, but also puts those building blocks in place to kind of build on for the future. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I think Nick kind of summarised it perfectly there. So is it, um, am I right in saying, so lots of people leading care organisations uh, who make the decisions on this type of stuff, they kind of assume that because they have an interconnect, internet connection and a certain amount of connectivity within their services, that they can just plumb in what they want, but then to use almost like um, uh, a, a, another technology analogy, if you run a uh, a mobile phone like a smartphone for long enough, eventually you you update. It does all sorts of different updates, and eventually that 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 phone is almost it's it's it, it doesn't work properly because the the expectations of the technology have surpassed the actual the hardware that the phone's actually built on. Uh, is that kind of a, a, a good analogy for this set of circumstances? Yeah, I think so. I mean, an analogy that used to get thrown around a lot is when you think about Wi-Fi, it's something that you can't see. So if we think of Wi-Fi like a light bulb and you've got a router in your, in your home, let's pretend that's a light bulb and that light emits. But of course, that light only goes so far and you have dark corners. So if you think Wi-Fi in that respect, then yeah, you, you really need to plan for where your users are, where your devices are, but also the load of those applications using it. So, yeah, you know, 
as we see technology change, the um, I think the requirement the the you know the requirement of technology behind it to support those increases. So organisations need to ensure that they have the correct infrastructure there to support that growth. You know that that technology um, uh, as it moves. Because I guess the more time goes by, the more technology care providers are going to be using. There's a kind of a bit of a digital revolution going on in, in social care. Um, the more that kind of the demands go up, uh, I guess the more the, the quality of the connectivity becomes an issue because you're just running more stuff through. Uh, it's almost like too too much of a, a narrow pipe to get all the data down or the, 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 the kind of in the environment through um, uh, through uh, from a connectivity perspective to, to actually correctly provide enough connectivity for the for the tools to be able to work to their to their maximum capacity so okay so in that respect then what are the problems that people are facing from a connectivity perspective like how does this all play out when it doesn't come together the way that it should you actually touched on there actually one of the problems that we see is that a lot of facilities and organizations typically are in rural locations. So actually the availability for broadband connection, internet connection is limited. Sometimes that might be that they're uh, limited bandwidth. So they're having to actually question who should actually use my bandwidth? Should it be uh, residents? Should it be staff? Ideally it's both. There are obviously ways to go around it, you know, fire with cabinet, lease lines, you know, there's the Starlink uh, satellite uh, connectivity system as well. But there's ways to get around it, but that's definitely one of the problems that we see. Um, I think as well, challenging environments. A lot of the environments we work in, they're old buildings, thick walls. You have fire doors in place. These are things that don't play nice with Wi-Fi and with connectivity of devices, anything. So where connectivity isn't designed around the environment it's going into, it causes huge, huge issues. Yeah, I think you've also got to think about the fact is that mm, multiple care environments aren't always necessarily um, people who are not able to move around. So you'll get, I mean, my mother-in-law was in a, a facility where they had their own individual rooms, but there was people on site, there was staff on site, there was care on site, but you came and go as you wanted to, as you saw fit, you know, it was more like a, a residential environment more than anything else. Now, the interesting thing about that is that they all had their own individual BT broadband, if they wanted it, in their own room. So you've got a number of things here. One is that people coming into that environment say, oh, I need to get connectivity because the mobile phones are. So then they're asking tenants for, can you give me your password for your Wi-Fi because I can't get on it? Or could you give me access to this or whatever? So it becomes quite cumbersome. Um, and then again, as you say, more and more people now, because of what's happened over the last two or three years, they want to put cameras and their own sensors in as a family so they know what's happening with their own people. So without having a controlled, planned infrastructure rollout in the environment where you can use it, it becomes a nightmare. Got you. OK. And OK, so that being the case, then, like fundamentally, why isn't the connectivity in many care services fit for purpose? Uh, a number of reasons. One is um, finance cost to do it. And, and I think that because telemedicine, remote, remote working, all that sort of stuff has only really come to the fore over the last couple of years. So nobody's really taken upon themselves to do the right thing. Um, they've not looked and said, oh, I could put a water sensor or a damp sensor or whatever into that environment to make it work. So, but now... There's a lot of white papers, there's a lot of stuff coming around, but people still don't have all that joined up thinking to make it work properly. Yeah, I 100% agree. You know, I think as, if you look at it, the actual use case for connectivity in care services is, is a newer thing. It has been a later adopter to technology. I mean, we were you know, having school, these conversations with schools 12 years ago they had that use case there but i think in in the care service it has seen a, it has been a late adopter so as nick kind of rightly said as it's been a late adopter there has been a lack of investment because there hasn't been that necessary need to invest you know a good amount of money into uh, getting these services up and running sure 
Sure. No, that makes uh, that makes sense. So I guess has this been somewhat heightened by COVID just because people have uh, there was a rapid adoption of technology as a result of uh, of COVID, which has probably been done relatively uh, rushed uh, because of the, the the set of circumstances, and that's left the because of the connectivity issues that's left the technology that the homes are being uh, I say the homes that the, the care services are being run on. Um, kind of almost like a disadvantage because that infrastructure isn't there you're right and and i think that um previously in care homes they'd look at it and say oh we need to have a network because we've got a computer here or computer there uh, and they've got uh, obviously a residence computer in the um in the in the lounge area so they've thought of it around that and typically even communications has been through either a walkie talkie or mobile phones talking about if they could get a good signal. Now, what's interesting is that um, all the people who are looking at apps, sensors are looking at it in isolation. So the problem is, and, and the same thing happens in the social housing market is that somebody comes up with an idea and go, oh, we need a sensor for this because we think it's really important. So rather than standing back and looking and say okay well that's one center what about other things what else can we do that we can bring into one infrastructure that's going to help us to support and provide care to the people in our thing and that's still not happening got you got you josh i guess anything else to, to, to add into that at all um i suppose going back to the original question like why isn't connectivity you know, fit for person a lot of them. And it kind of goes back to what you said earlier with, you know, things like COVID and a lot of networking or connectivity has been put a bit ad hoc. Of course, there's been hardware limitations and supply issues over the last few years on top of this, but it's meant that some organizations have kind of invested maybe what money available to extend Wi-Fi coverage to certain areas, but Either requirements changed over time, it hasn't really been planned around the users, around the environment. So they're now kind of running a network that isn't fit for purpose. It isn't fit for the need and their users and their staff right now. And I can imagine the more the technology, the more people are using more technology and things like that, the more obsolete and the more the the, the, the connectivity infrastructure is just going to end up failing. Um, yeah. uh, another, like, how does that, what does that look like when that goes wrong? Like, what are the implications? So if you've got good pieces of technology, but that things, it's just not set up correctly from a connectivity perspective, like what are the pitfalls there that uh, uh, that, that potentially can happen as a, as a result? I think it's just communication breakdown, um, either with residents or, or users not being able to access uh, communication services to schemes such as family and friends. From a, you know, a, a procedure or a staff point of view, losing access to telemedicine telehealth lack of loss of data um you know a lot of the time on these uh cloud-based applications if you don't have a network coverage that data stored locally until you hit a data a, a wi-fi network to upload that data so there's definite issues there and potential issues that could happen if that data remains on a local device rather than being uploaded to cloud and being downloaded onto everyone else's devices I think there's another angle to it as well, and it's the families of the people that are in these places, because as we saw with lockdown, people's people wanted to go and see their families, but they couldn't. And there was the, the obviously the uproar about, um, you know, isolation, people not being able to get access. You couldn't even get, if you didn't have a mobile phone signal or you didn't have Wi-Fi, you couldn't even do a video call, a Zoom call or whatever with your your friends and family. And, and that again, caused its own problems in terms of being social isolation because they couldn't really talk to anybody, see anybody other than maybe one carer. Um, and that causes its own problems. But having connectivity means that you can still give them a perception or even a, a, a virtual, my friends and my family are still with me and I've got them on a video, not, oh my God, they don't know what's happening. I can't get hold of them. I can't see them. So getting it right, it has a number of different side effects. A quick word about one of the sponsors who helps make the Care Leaders Network podcast possible. Bev and Britain works in partnership with the social care sector, delivering high quality legal and regulatory advice. Their award-winning teams across the UK provide workforce, regulatory, corporate, 
commercial, real estate and litigation advice, and their team truly believes in strong partnerships. They really understand what it takes to deliver outstanding care and to build a thriving business. To find out more, head to bevanbritton.com. Got you, because I guess talking to jo Josh is um, what seemed like one of the main points in there. You've got the kind of almost like the regulatory side of things. The CQC is going to be looking more and more at data if the uh, if the connectivity isn't up to up to scratch. If something could be logged, but then if it's not registered correctly, that could then lead to uh, obviously some negative implications from a from a regulatory and from a, a quality assurance per perspective. Um, and then I guess Nick, you're you're you're, you're and it's an important point as well like if you've got a home that where people are used to interacting uh, outside digitally if they can't do that then that's going to cause stress may lead to loneliness um depending on the kind of the severity of the set of circumstances but none of it's um none of it's good uh that's uh it, it sounds like that's pretty pretty clear um I guess like let's talk cost for a second because I guess the, the anyone looking at this will think well okay great like obviously connectivity sounds like it's important but is it just going to cost me a, an arm and a leg and I I can imagine there's probably some misconceptions maybe around that as uh, as well so what is the cost of great connect connectivity and and also I guess how can it be made affordable uh, I'll start that one um we've been been successful in loads and loads of markets in terms of provisioning the right infrastructure to address the right challenge for a business, for a school, for a college, for a hospital, whatever. Um, what we are seeing now is, um, and especially if I look at the, the wider uh, multi-dwelling unit marketplace, which care comes under, um, there is now a, a feeling that uh, having it included within in a rental cost for a property, if you've got a buy to rent property or you've got a, an ongoing rental for a property, you add a, a portion of that service cost into the rent. Um, so you then amortize it over a period of time. And it's like leasing, right? You can lease equipment on a five year with a low bubble payment at the end. So there's lots of different financial ways of doing it. What was interesting also, um, being on this call yesterday, Three of the four people on the call didn't know that there were funds, NHS government funds, to allow them to be able to upgrade infrastructure. One person on the call said, oh, we had some funds from the NHS central government. And they went, really? What's that? And I think it was called um, Digital digital Transformation, National Digitization Fund for Care Services. And they didn't know about it. And, and that's a, a local government among thing but it's not being communicated. So there are lots of ways of being able to add and to enable infrastructure without having to pay for it out of their own pocket. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, I mean, you know, a part of our approach to business is that consultative approach. It's understanding what an organization already has in place. Um, if we look at connectivity, you know, from uh, a broadband connection to a firewall, to data, structure cabling, switching and core and edge, Wi-Fi, there could be some elements that certain organizations already have in place or that we can make use of. So it doesn't necessarily have to be this huge project. Um, I think it's important to engage with people and understand what you currently have, what you can make use of, but then also build, what's your end goal? In, in two, three years time, do you want site-wide coverage? Maybe some clients don't. Some organizations, for example, are doing phased approach. So um, we've spoke about actually rolling out initially and not allowing it onto residents. We'll start with staff because that's what their budgets allow. So if we look at just a, a pure CapEx model, that kind of works quite well because we can say, right, let's look at maybe um, areas where you have uh, more, more residents mixing, communal areas. Maybe it's some corridors where staff tend to do data upload about um, medical care, about health, about anything like that. So actually, maybe we don't need to look at a full wireless cabling deployment. Maybe we can start on key areas and then expand out over three, five years. Um, and as Nick says, you know, looking at an OPEX position, there's so many financial models and support available now that you can have really uh, around however you want. And you can then do everything all at once or do the structured approach and then build upon that OPEX model over a period of time. And then, yeah, you know, as Nick said, as we've seen in assisted living, a lot of residents are coming in with that 
expectation of a home from home experience. They're bringing their Sky router, their, their Virgin access. So if they're already paying, so they're used to that concept of paying a monthly fee for Wi-Fi connectivity. So it allows organizations, particularly in the care sector with that assisted living environment, to actually look to monetize that network access, either add it onto rental premiums, offer it out to guest access. So it can be something that you look at the OPEX costs over five, 10 years, you look at your resident usage and actually suddenly that big cost doesn't look so bad. Right, got you. So I guess the main message there is that there are options kind of from a structuring of the finance perspective to make sure that there's, it's not just a big hole in the the, the, the care organisations bank balance as a, as a result of the, the, the connectivity. There's, there's various different ways that can be set up that are sensible, pretty straightforward, uh, and that are, um, yeah, that just aren't going to end up in a set of circumstances where the organisations uh, just having to fork out a shed load of cash um, without there being uh, a sensible way for that to be managed from a profitability perspective. I was going to say, I think as well with this, it's important to, uh, with that approach to, to talk about the end goal, you know, to have um, where that money's going, what, how the organisation is going to benefit from that. So they can see, I, I don't know if it gives validation to that spend, because there's no guessing where, you know, it can be an expensive exercise, but if the benefits are there, then obviously that's going to help incredibly towards the reasons why we're doing this. Sure. Yeah, of course. I, it, I mean, it's got to be one of those cost uh, value over cost exercises. Um, value's got to be the predetermining factor, but the costing has to be an important consideration as, as well. So I guess it's just kind of an element of of juggling those those two different uh, two different yeah. parts of the equation. So I guess like, OK, so you've um, you've made the investment, you've managed to set it up in a way that makes makes sense for, 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 for you as an organisation. What does connectivity look like in the in the future? Because technology is obviously evolving really, really quickly. Uh, I think the care sector, Josh, you alluded to it earlier, I think he's probably generally behind the curve a little bit when it comes to, to other industries and other sectors. Um, but the, the the rapidity of the adoption seems to be certainly picking up pace, I guess, with government funding and things like that as well coming into um, uh, coming into the equation. It's going to become um, it's certainly not going to slow down in, in, in any time soon. So talk me through, um, yeah, exactly what does that mean as we cast our eyes to the to the future? If, if you think about it, when, when I first came into the wireless industry, I've been in sort of communications for since I left school, but uh, in terms of wireless, even as much as 15 years ago, wireless was seen as a giveaway. It was, you know, your business was you you buy the switching architecture or the all the fancy stuffs on the switches and oh we want some wi-fi oh yeah we'll give that away um but now you look at the billions and billions of devices and that number is only going to double if not treble over the next five years even if not more because everything has a chip or a communications device in some way shape or form the the home of the future, and this is why the likes of BT and Virgin and their devices and their routers are being upgraded because they can't deal with the amount of devices that are now being connected to a home hub, which is why we are getting more involved because we have an enterprise grade wireless system to allow you to have hundreds of devices connected to a network. Now, if you think of toasters are now getting Wi-Fi tips and kettles, dishwashers, wash. These are all wanting to be connected because somebody somewhere wants the data from those devices for management, service, um, refresh, whatever. So having this invisible connectivity gives you the ability to be able to plug in lots and lots of things that are using standards-based communications. So Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, LoRaWAN, if you get it right, it all just plugs in. So you've made the investment at the beginning. Now you're just adding the services that you need to give the care to the people in the in the building. Yeah. Yes, really big part of that is like because because leaders of care organisations, uh, certainly uh, many of the uh, care leaders network members are are super excited about technology. I guess if you don't have that infrastructure there to be able to 
to, to, to be able to support all of this wonderful technology, which people are getting rightly excited about, it's just not going to work to the extent that it should do. And then you've kind of mitigated uh, the kind of the overall impact that the some of these fancy pieces of technology are, are going to have. And then why go to the effort of implementing this fantastic piece of technology if it doesn't work to its fullest extent because of the the, the restrictions, I guess, on the from a connectivity perspective, is that is, is that a fair um, summarization of what you said? Yes and no. So technology, quite rightly, does change. It gets upgraded. So we're on Wi-Fi 6 now. We'll be on Wi-Fi 7 in the home probably by the end of the year, beginning of next, and in the enterprise space, probably the end of 24, beginning of 25. So connectivity is only as much as the users and the data that are putting off on, on a stack. It all starts off having a big fat pipe coming into the building in the first place. If that's a wet, uh, a tea bag and a wet piece of string, you're not going to get much going out of the building, but um, you can buy technology now that will deliver a service for the next five years quite easily. We're not going to see big enough chunks of change in terms of, what people want to do um, in the next five years, it's going to take up all that bandwidth. So I think if you invest um, and you put the infrastructure right, you can take it and you can upgrade it in five years time if you need to, but it's about getting it right first time. In terms of what, what where we see what the future, if we look into where other markets are, so uh, as Nick said, like, you know, the rise of IoT in other markets is actually a good indicator so already in certain sectors we're seeing um environmental monitoring so knowing if uh, a room is empty and then turning off the lights turning off the electricity perhaps on devices if a room is getting too hot or the air quality is not a certain of a sufficient level opening a window but all of this is managed with sensors all of this is managed through iot platforms so actually, it's almost like the interconnected room, how it's becoming smart living, it's becoming resourceful living. And that's kind of, that's where we are actually right now. But in terms of where care services are going, because it is that late adopted, that, it, that is where we see possibly the next five years, that technology coming into, or, so, I mean, I'm, no doubt some, um, some care services are already there, but maybe on a, a wider market that we'll see that sort of technology come into play. Sure, sure. It's interesting, isn't it? So um, the Internet of Things, the way that everything's going to be connected in the future, and it is increasingly so. That's so you've got the so you've got the the rapid adoption of technology and care services happening at once. You've got the ever increasing interconnectivity of just stuff, uh, aka uh, the Internet of Things. But we've got. Um, almost like digital convergence as well. I think that's how it was described to me once where you've got all these incredible pieces of technology kind of bouncing into each other and then kind of a new way, a new means of connecting two different pieces of technology together then drives a completely different output. I guess we're, we're starting to see that with things like machine learning and AI and automation and all of that type of type of stuff. And of course, all of that all of that needs all of that needs connectivity. I guess that on the backdrop of Moore's law, which is the the exponential growth of uh, a technology over a period of time. Um, yeah, you, we don't want to be sat around in the in the future complaining about the fact that our Wi-Fi is not uh, not working properly when we've got all this incredible technology around us. So this uh, uh, this is it, on, on on a personal for pe level for people at, um, on their day to day life. We've all had that moment where that web page doesn't doesn't load uh, as quickly as it might do. That's that's really really frustrating. And we've all, we've almost got used to this level of immediacy now, where things should just bang 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 bang. They should just 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 work. And with all of the, all of the demands of all these technologies, all um, I guess increasing over over time, it just really re reinforces the the, the 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 use case for great great connectivity. So talk to me about the things that people need to know to make sure that they are set up for the future because i guess it's if people are watching this and they're in that set of circumstances where they they know that maybe their infrastructure from a connectivity perspective is a bit creaky and it's not 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 necessarily fit for the fit the future i guess they'll they'll get an appreciation from our conversation around why it's important what the implications are going to be potentially and it's some of the pitfalls of not getting it right um what do you need to do to 
to, to, to make sure that you are, um, yeah, you've got everything that you need to be uh, in place for the future as things develop. So I think one of the key things we try and get across to people is, is don't run before you can walk. Get the basics right. You know, these are unfortunately are kind of the boring things, but it's ensuring you have the reliable internet connection with, and with sufficient bandwidth for your site, for your users, the use case, the applications being used, making sure you've got structured cabling around the site. So, you know, enough data points for access points in, in the right locations. Um, you know, ideally using Cat6, Cat6A cabling, resilient core and edge switching infrastructure that is there, you know, to support you for the next 10 years. If you get those fundamental basics right, in the future, you can build on that. So as Wi-Fi changes, as Nick said, you know, we're in this point now where you've kind of got three generations of Wi-Fi available on the market or soon to be on the market at the same time with Wi-Fi 6, 6E and, and 7. So as Wi-Fi 6E and 7, they use um, a 6 gigahertz band. So it's a, a newer band, you know, faster speeds effectively. But it allows you to build on that. And as technology changes, as IoT comes available, you can support that, but you have to make sure that the plumbing is right. I think you've also got to think um, in terms of the whole environment is that the people that were in those types of facilities were, from an age perspective as well, weren't, weren't used to having access to this digital technology on a day-to-day -day basis. They didn't grow up with Facebook, with Twitter, with WhatsApp and all that. So we are now seeing a generation of people coming into these environments that are expecting it, are using it. So the ability of not having to have it has its own mental health issues. You just got to look at if you turned off Wi-Fi in a college or a school or whatever, or you got rid of the internet, how many frustrated people there would be in one open space, all trying to get onto the internet? Oh, it doesn't work, doesn't work, and it's it is scary. And, and there've been there've been tests and things done around that, and uh, yeah, it doesn't look pretty. Um, but I think that josh is right in terms of even if you've got older cabling and you can't afford to upgrade the cabling there is still an element of what you can do with the existing infrastructure you've got you don't have to replace everything but you've got to look at it as um as an opportunity to say i've got cat 5a that will do me for another couple of years until I need to upgrade and you can do it piecemeal because you may not get the funding from government to do everything, but you could do something that's critical. Um, and I think from my perspective, it's, as Josh said, don't run before you can walk, stand back, look what you want to achieve and offer, and then look at it and then build the building blocks to get you to where you need to be. Sounds like sage advice. Well, look, gentlemen, I think we've done a, a good job of, uh, of answering our, our initial question, which is, are your services correctly enabled? Hopefully that will be um, uh, um, uh, a good framework for people to give some consideration around their connectivity and their care services uh, and give, give them some food for thought around, are we, are we ready for have we got the right infrastructure for today and if we if we have then that's great but maybe maybe we don't have the correct infrastructure for the future so great to speak to you both today and thank you very much for your time thank you thank you